It was 1980 when 53-year-old Wilhelm Stieber, one of the three directors of the German airline Aero Lloyd, was found shot and stabbed to death at the side of a road close to a Bavarian service station. The dead man's car was soon recovered from a nearby gravel pit and on the front seat of that car was the gun that had killed him. The weapon was soon traced to a 35-year-old Austrian airline pilot named Peter Pertl and a warrant was issued for his arrest. However, by the time the German authorities had named their suspect, Peter had already left the country, first flying to South America and then to Nigeria, a country that had no extradition treaty with West Germany. And that's where he remained for the next few years. Four years later, on the cold morning of the 10th of November 1984, an ordinary looking barge full of refuse cruised down the River Thames, headed for the 1,600 acre refuse tip at Pitsy, Essex. But it wasn't until the next day that the lorries and bulldozers came to unload the barge and scatter the tons of rubbish. It was workman George Fletcher who made the discovery. As he scooped a load of waste from the barge, a black sack split open. What fell out of that sack froze George Fletcher. It was quite clearly the torso of a woman, still clad in a black corset and a beige silk dressing gown. When the police were called, the rest of the barge's cargo was closely examined. A hard task made more difficult, given that a large amount of it had already been scattered across the tip. It would be another week before the woman's head, arms and left leg were found. According to a pathologist, she died three days before George Fletcher found her torso. The cause of death was a stab wound to the chest that had punctured a lung. It was believed that the same knife, along with a saw, was used to dismember her body. Dental records and fingerprint checks drew a blank, and she bore no resemblance to any black females recently reported missing in London. The case remained cold for almost four months. Then, in February of 1985, an anxious young Nigerian woman entered a central London police station on Gerald Road, Belgravia, and approached a young constable by the name of Sean Patterson. Her name was Vivian Odemanan. She had just flown in from Lagos and was in search of her 31-year-old sister, Veronica. She handed over some snapshots of Veronica to the constable and explained that her sister, who had been an air hostess for the Nigerian-based Intercontinental Airlines, had travelled to London back in November of 1984 from her home in Kano, northern Nigeria, with her husband, Peter Pertle. They were in London to do some Christmas shopping. She went on to explain that when the 39-year-old Peter returned to Nigeria much sooner than was expected, he was alone. He told Veronica's family that she had remained in London after leaving him for another man. His story failed to convince Vivienne. She knew that her sister loved Peter and, as far as she was aware, Veronica had no other acquaintances in London. Not to mention the fact that she had sent the family a postcard telling them of the presents she had bought and that she was looking forward to seeing them on her return. Constable Sean Patterson, who was aware of the Essex cold case, put Vivienne in touch with Essex police. This eventually led to the body on the Thames barge being identified as Veronica Pertle. Although Veronica was very much a stranger in London, she did have one acquaintance, another Nigerian woman named Alusian Mukan, the wife of a wealthy man and the student in the city. Peter and Veronica were also very wealthy because Peter had been born into money. He was the son of a Viennese millionaire. During their time in London, the Pertles stayed in an apartment in Arabella Court at the fashionable Marlborough Place in St. John's Wood. On November the 6th, 1984, Veronica and her friend Alusian met at the apartment and went shopping in West London. 
There, Veronica is said to have spent almost £7,000 on clothes, a handbag, jewellery, underwear and gifts for her family. The following day, when Elusian Mukan called Veronica at the Arabella Court apartment, she got no reply. When she made an inquiry at the apartment desk, she was told that Veronica and Peter had checked out. When the case was handed over to Scotland Yard, contact was made with the authorities in Nigeria. They requested an extradition of Peter Pirtle. It was granted, but nothing could have prepared the three Lagos detectives for the stranger-than-fiction scenario that lay ahead. The men caught a plane from Lagos to Kano in the hope that they would find Peter at his home. But to their sheer disbelief, they learned that Peter Pirtle was flying the plane. Now panicked, the detectives discreetly ordered the hostesses not to reveal their presence, fearing that their man might hijack his own plane. However, after 90 tense minutes, the southern Sahara came into view as they approached the city of Kano. The detectives must have breathed a sigh of relief as the plane touched down. When Pirtle eventually cut the engines, he was quickly arrested and taken back to Lagos. It was one detective inspector, David Smith, and another officer who flew from London to Lagos to carry out Pirtle's extradition. By now, Scotland Yard's investigation was well underway. Traces of blood had now been found at the apartment Peter and Veronica had shared. It was also discovered that on November 7th, 1984, Peter Pirtle had paid his regular cleaner the sum of £20 to stay away from the apartment that day. With all current evidence considered, it was agreed by authorities that Peter had likely paid for the cleaner's absence so that he could carry out the murder of his wife without interruption. Following his extradition, he was arrested and charged with the murder of Veronica. His trial took place at Chelmsford Crown Court in 1986. There he denied murdering his wife, but admitted to cutting her up after finding her body at the London apartment. Prosecutor Anthony Hidden QC said that Pirtle was an intelligent, cunning and persuasive liar who had cold-bloodedly killed his wife and disposed of her body in a carefully conceived plan, then returned to Nigeria acting the bereft widower with a fabricated story of lost love. Anthony Hidden added, Instead of burial with tribal rites in Kano, to which she was entitled, his wife's body went out with the rubbish in London. In the witness box, Peter claimed that Veronica and her family were heavily involved in smuggling heroin through Stansted Airport and that he believed his wife had been killed by a drug gang. The story he told the courtroom was detailed and delivered with conviction. He claimed that for years, heroin and marijuana were being smuggled on a weekly basis from Nigeria to Stansted, London on Intercontinental Airways flights. The flights would leave Lagos on a Friday and arrive in London on a Saturday morning, he said. The drugs would be hidden in emergency oxygen bottles and under stewardesses' hats and in their bras. Small-breasted stewardesses were chosen specifically so that they could fill their bras with narcotics. There were never more than 40 passengers on a plane, he said, but there were always at least eight stewardesses. Peter referred to one particular flight which attempted to land in heavy fog on the 5th of September 1982. The plane came in to land 400 yards off course and struck the tail of a Flying Tiger DC-8 aircraft while it was parked in the airport's cargo area. The flight then had to be diverted to Manchester. Peter claimed that during that diversion, all the drugs were flushed down the toilet. When speaking of the events which unfolded at Arabella Court on the 7th of November, Peter said that when he found Veronica's body slumped in a chair in just her corset, he knew she must have known her killer, because she would not have opened the door to a stranger in just her underwear. The apartment had also been ransacked, he added, and the one thing that made it clear to him that it was the work of drug dealers was that orange juice cartons had been ripped open. He said that it was obvious that they had been looking for drugs. According to Peter, that was the moment he realised the amount of trouble he was in, but instead of calling the police, he decided to deal with the situation himself. He said he then downed some whiskey, left the building and visited a nearby ironmonger where he purchased the finest saw he could find. He then returned to the apartment, hung a do not disturb sign on the door, moved Veronica's body to the bathtub and began the dismemberment. He then placed the ten pieces into black sacks and threw them in a nearby rubbish skip. 
He disposed of his wife's body, he said, because he was afraid that he would be blamed for her death. And back in Nigeria, he feared he would be labelled as the white man who killed the girl from Kano. When speaking on the allegations that Veronica and her family had been involved with drug trafficking, Peter added that Veronica's brother Raymond had demanded £150,000 compensation from him after he had flushed his drugs down the toilet back in Nigeria. Peter made similar allegations towards his sister-in-law Vivienne, who also denied demanding money from him after his destruction of her stocks of heroin. Both Raymond and Vivian went on to retort that they would have to be foolish to get involved in drug trafficking, as the penalty for such crimes in Nigeria was death by firing squad. Peter Pirtle then made serious accusations of the Nigerian police force. He described his time in custody while awaiting extradition to London and portrayed a horror story. He said that in an attempt to make him confess, the officers kicked him in the kidneys, cut his testicles with pliers and threw acid in his face, blinding him for 10 days. He said that he begged the officers to urinate in his eyes in a desperate bid for relief and showed the court scars on his chest that he claimed had been caused by razors. He added that he was fed rats, given minimal water and ate whatever insects he could find. Peter's counsel, Gilbert Gray QC, told the court that if Peter wanted to kill his wife, he could have done so where they lived, on the edge of the vast Sahara, where life is cheap and the body might never be found. Gilbert Gray added that the act of dismemberment may well disgust people, but Pirtle was not on trial for inspiring disgust. However, despite the efforts of both Peter and his counsel, a jury found him guilty of murder on the 18th of November 1986. He was jailed for life with a minimum 15-year term. Judge Justice Borum, who sentenced him, said, Your wife died a cruel death at an early age, and having killed her, you subjected her body to the most callous treatment. No man would treat the body of a woman he loved in the way that you butchered that woman. In 1987, Peter Pirtle was transferred from England to a prison in his native Austria to face another trial, that of the murder of 53-year-old Wilhelm Steiber, the director of the German airline Aero Lloyd, whom Peter had shot and killed in Bavaria, Germany in 1980. I regrettably have no details of what led to Peter Pirtle killing Wilhelm Steiber or the trial, but what I do know is that they were business partners in the running of Aero Lloyd and that the airline had faced financial difficulty in 1980. Whatever the case may have been, Peter was ultimately charged with manslaughter and ordered to serve his new sentence concurrently with the sentence he had received for killing Veronica. <laughs> 